Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, theorems, whatever you want to call it. Doesn't really matter, but it's a very biased perspective. Of course, it should be because it's uh, my favorite, whatever, <laughs> subfields of mathematics. Um, yeah, subfields of mathematics. And I would like to talk about something that some people would call maybe theoretical biology, but there's also kind of a huge intersection with what people call mathematical biology. And whether that's really a subfield of mathematics or of biology, it's probably a little bit of matter of taste. But I would like to sell a certain type of idea, uh, so I just count it as a field, subfield of uh, mathematics. In particular, usually there is some really nice back and forth between the two fields. So um, advancing one using the other, and then new questions arise, which advances the original one or something like this. It's like kind of really nice. And it mostly happens with physics and math. So physics and math are fantastic. They go hand in hand, uh, advancing one, advances the other in some sense. But it's also happening on a slightly uh, downscaled version with, with other things like chemistry or biology. And mathematical biology has become a really trendy thing uh, for really real world reasons. So whatever analysis of viruses or something that's, that's really important uh the spread of epidemics the growth of population all of that fun stuff uh but also more down-to-earth things down to earth also more non-dynamical things like how cells work how cancer works something like this statistical analysis of medical data um all of that jazz which is like Un unbelievably important, obviously. And it's usually a really nice example how mathematics, which was mostly developed quite a while ago uh, with, for, by people just doing, well, we want to do this, this thing because it's fun. And then in, in the end, turns out to be super useful. So that's why I um, always support mathematics if you, have, if you have money, even though there might be the, the, the first applications might show up like much, much later. So that's what usually happens. And biology is kind of a, a really beautiful example where this really happens. So biology at this point, it's like essentially all of mathematics it has some applications in biology. Um, yeah, let me just motivate a little bit uh, where everything comes from. Maybe a little bit of a history uh, lesson here, lesson today. So, so as we all know, rabbits grow like the Fibonacci numbers. Yeah, uh, that's like a very well-known statement. And maybe this was the first instance of mathematical biology a long, long, long time ago. So the Fibonacci numbers, in case you don't remember how that works, is like 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. So you always take uh, the sum and do this. Then you sum those two and get 3 and so on. Yeah, and this was kind of the first, in some sense, I hope I'm not completely wrong, the first uh, mass biology model ever in a really simplified way. Keep in mind that model means you want to kind of model something, obviously, but you can make it kind of in a toy version, right? So make it as easy as possible, ignore whatever, all the circumstances. Here you just put perfect rabbits, essentially, in, an, in a closed system and see what happens. Essentially, that's what it is. So that's modeling. It's a really crucial idea of uh, the sciences, how science works in general. You model something by ignoring difficulties. That's really an important thing to do. And mathematics does the same, by the way. We ignore difficulties. We just call that an axiom system that we build. And then we kind of play in our axiom system. And modeling the world is nothing different. So whenever you see a model of the world, it cannot be perfect because kind of, the world is too difficult and you're kind of ignoring a lot of things. And then it kind of depends a little bit how efficient your model is compared to its simplicity right so how efficient it describes uh some real world effects and probably rapid growth a la fibonacci is not it's not super efficient but it was kind of the earliest of its kind so we kind of forgive fibonacci here and we just all like the fibonacci sequence and essentially all of mass biology that's a little bit of a stretch, but I will say it anyway. Essentially, all of mass biology is some version of this rabbit counting, um, maybe in more sophisticated ways. But anyway, the Fibonacci was like way ahead of their time, like, oh God, hundreds of years, because um, biology really took a long time to, to be really become a science. 
in a sense of certain rigor. So the kind of the more real world is in your science, the more difficult it was historically speaking to treat it like like um, scientifically correct, like scientifically rigor. So for mathematics, that's like really easy. You just be in your bubble, be in your little model, and you just do whatever you want. Uh, but if you want to describe real world system, it gets much more difficult. So medicine or something that it took a very long time to be uh, kind of really rigorous in a in a certain sense of well, the history of science. Um, and that's not really saying that people haven't done it before. Clearly, the medicine is pretty old, probably as old as human beings, but they have done a lot of shit in the past. Not everything was shit, but there was a lot of shit because it wasn't it was so difficult to model it scientifically where kind of the, the basics, the foundation were not developed enough. And that's kind of what you see in the history of science. So usually it goes like mass is first considered to be a science, then, then maybe physics and chemistry, then biology, then medicine, because the more applied it is, the more difficult it actually is to be rigorous because life is just so difficult. And this was a long waffle to just say, that's why we model. Model is kind of kicking out difficulties and we'll just see what comes out. And here in our little rabbit example, um, which is like a really way oversimplification of how rabbits work, obviously. But anyway, we'll take it. We get some nice answer. You know, we get a Fibonacci sequence. And this is kind of a good example how a biology question advanced mathematics and not just the other way around. Um, of course, eventually, you also want to advance biology using mathematics. That's the whole point of this video. But here is kind of an early example how, how it worked the other way around. And in modern days, um, let's go, we'll go more to kind of a modern days approach, but maybe kind of the real beginnings. So people will actually use a bit of a stretch, I guess. The real beginnings is a famous book, really long actually, kind of the first version was already 700 pages or something, um, which is called On Growth and Form uh, around 19... Uh, 17 so it's actually surprisingly new so as a mathematician you always run into this this idea that everything was already done by the old Greeks yeah yeah everything is already like part of 18,000 years ago uh, where people started carving prime numbers into bones or something it's a very very ancient but as I just tried to explain all of the sciences because they are so much more difficult because you're describing real world before they really became kind of rigorous it took a long time and you were really surprised, every, I'm really every time surprised if I look into for something like medicine or biology and I'm like, oh, that's pretty recent in some sense. And so a hundred years ago, if you watch this video in 2024, um, essentially mass biology started, which is pretty recent compared to my 18,000 year old, we are carving prime numbers into bones examples. Anyway, um, so this book was this kind of usually uh, regarded as one of the first instances of mass biology and they do pretty cool stuff actually in that book uh, not just kind of geometric shapes of certain bacteria or whatever it is uh, so like whatever it's a, it's a pentagon it's a isocahedron something like that but also something like kind of the first easy models that you really see here something like the weight of an animal increases with a cube of its length um, again, just modeling, of course, it's not true for all animals, but it actually comes quite close. And the only real problem, which I definitely should mention here, with this book is um, that Thompson completely ignored or rejected, actually, the natural selection, which is one of these key ideas in the history of sciences, which was very, very debated for a long, long time. And even in, in 1917, this was not yet, it, it's probably not even yet established yet. So um, anyway, so this is a little bit of a catch. So evolution is not covered in that book, but a lot of things are. It's kind of the start then of mathematical biology. And nowadays it's just it's just ridiculous. It's absolutely beautiful what, what uh, biologists do with mass concepts. Some of them like really recent, like not theory is not an old field of mathematics. Um, as a field itself, maybe it really emerged in the 1980s, which is fairly recent. I was studied before, as I said, but it kind of really emerged in the 1980s. And biologists are already using it because the way how uh, DNA knots, um, so this is really a beautiful picture here. So you can kind of really see that there's a, the resolution is not really great. I apologize 
But anyway, here like you can really see the little crossing going over here, exactly like in the, the model of a knot. Anyway, I just love this picture. Anyway, so complexity of life implies that mass biology actually really needs, uses most fields of mathematics. It's really, really amazing. So even the more pure ones, like, like not theory. And it's really surprising, it's really beautiful. Um, so the, the property of DNA is mostly given how it knots itself in space, how it arranges itself in space, and it tied, tied, uh, tend to form knots. So biologists use several tools like knot invariants to tell, uh, to, to just say, oh, this DNA is like not this, or this DNA is not this, or whatever, something like this. It's really, really, really amazing. And essentially you could think, or you should think that all of mathematics somehow plays a role in biology, which is kind of a really good selling point for mathematics, if you want, because essentially everything eventually will play uh, a role somewhere. Kind of the surprising fact, which I never really understood and probably nobody really does, is life really modeled after mathematics or is mathematics modeled after life or both? Who knows? Uh, or neither? Who knows? I've uh, now had all four possibilities, I guess. Anyway, so more of a classical example, and then my favorite theorem here of um, how mass biology works is a lot of mass biology is dynamical systems, um, differential equations, because it kind of makes sense. Differential equations describe how uh, some system evolves over time, and that's just perfect for biology. You can think of a biology system. And what I really like about this example, which was one of the first of its kind, the lotka volterra equation, is that nowadays, like so many things are modeled using differential equations, because it's kind of a really good idea, but eventually someone who needed to come up with this idea, and this is one of the, the first examples in biology. It's a really fantastic one, uh, kind of the prey-predator dynamics. So again, it's a model, so you only have one prey and you only have one predator, and uh, the prey is eaten by the predator and some simplifications obviously and essentially it boils down to a nice differential equation where x is, is the number of rabbits eh, the prey uh, y is the number of foxes the predator and then there's alpha so let me just mark it here alpha is the growth rate of the rabbits we know how that works yeah keep in mind we know how rabbits grow yeah we know how rabbits grow yeah uh, fibonacci <laughs> Just kidding. So some growth of rabbits, rabbits grow, yeah? and then the growth of the foxes is delta, and it depends on the number of rabbits, because the foxes eat the rabbits. And the same way, uh, kind of exactly in the same way, the, well, this is a bad color, and uh, maybe this one, the foxes will die, then just depending on, well, the number of them. And in the same way, the rabbits will die if there are too many foxes around. So this is how this, this kind of, e the differential equation is kind of interlaced. So rabbits just grow, keep in mind, Fibonacci, foxes only grow when there are rabbits around, and foxes just die, and rabbits just die when there are foxes around. Kind of a little bit of an oversimplified model, and you get this really beautiful behavior. Um, it's kind of models, I have a better picture on the next slide, but it kind of models uh, this little behavior of the number of rabbits will go up, and a little bit later, the number of foxes will go up because then there's more, there are more rabbits to eat. And then the, eventually the number of rabbits must decline because there are too many foxes. And then a little bit later, the number of foxes declines because there are not many, not enough rabbits anymore. And then if the number of foxes is low enough, the number of rabbits goes up. It's really beautiful. So it's like this up and down curve. So you have one curve and you have another curve and they're a little bit uh, shifted towards another, just the number of rabbits or foxes that you can just model that um, using a differential equation which is really cool and this is one of the, the first of its kind and I really like it because of this balance it really has a good balance between easy and powerful right it's just, it works really well and the description of the system is not difficult mathematically speaking it's kind of a very easy uh, differential equation and here's a little bit of a better, nicer picture so what you see here are certain specific values. Don't worry too much about the values. And then each orbit here corresponds to different starting values for the number of foxes and the number of rabbits. And you can kind of see this nice behavior. Uh, the number of rabbits goes up in this direction. The number of foxes goes up in this direction. So you kind of always have the same type of behavior. The number of rabbits goes up a little bit. And then it needs to go down while the number of foxes go up. And eventually it closes almost like a nice type of circle. 
and you have this uh, nice fixed point here in the middle, which is kind of the equilibrium state where um, nothing would actually change if that would ever be achieved. Of course, again, this is just a model. So this is like foxes and rabbits in a vacuum, if you want. Uh, but anyway, it's a pretty cool way to explain how population dynamics works. And this is really, so this is a real world, real world example. So this is really somewhat how it works if you leave foxes and rabbits uh, alone. And this is like one key example how to explain um, something in biology using mathematical models and this is last was one of the first of its kind it's super i really love, love it a lot it's super powerful and uh very easy at the same time maybe not very easy easy at the same time anyway i hope you enjoyed this video and i also hope to see you next time